So we're here today talking to Demetrius Vouras, who's an anthropologist, a photojournalist, um, and a freelance researcher and reporter on humanitarian issues, war, poverty, and social injustice. He's covered special assignments in so many different places, including Greece, um, the Balkans, the Middle East, um, specializing in Kyrgyz um, Kyrgyzstan, as well as Sub-Saharan Africa and elsewhere. Um, his awards include Amnesty International, um, a Pritch, Pritchett Commission, and honours from Pictures of the Year International, and his work has been exhibited extensively in Greece. So I just wanted to ask you generally to talk about your practice, but I thought maybe first would speak about the exhibition, The Itinerary, Tracing the Refugee Routes, that's on um, show here as part of the King's Transnational Law Summit. So it's an exhibition that you put together with a group of 11 photojournalists um, that's tracing the journeys of refugees um, as they're coming to Europe. Right. Um, and can you, I wanted to ask you to speak about some of the photos that you have in the exhibition and the process of putting that exhibition together. Um, but some of the pictures of yours that really struck me was part of your Sisyphus's plight series which was then located in the um, Damascus refugee camp in Iraq, just 60 kilometres out of Syria. And some of the really touching things in those images too was that amidst the devastation and the difficulties of life in the camp that you document with women collecting water, there was also the pictures focusing on how you know life must go on, of wedding dresses in shops, of the Arcade Street called Paris Avenue. And I was wondering if you could speak about the role of photography in capturing both the the day-to-day -day of people's lives as well as the the severe challenges that people are facing in these circumstances. Excellent point, excellent question if I may say because usually this image is, these pictures are by the side in the journalism, these are not the favorable of the mm -hmm. editors and this is because of the current state of the news today we're experiencing after the death of the newspaper practically and the death of the editor and the way news are created by the audience rather by the journalists and the media what I'm saying is uh, by the death of the newspaper where all of us we were expecting when to be published and everybody from white color blue colors with the same price we got the same paper and selected images selected topics Nowadays, using our cell phones, tablet, tablets, whatever, we demand the news. We demand the news in a way, I'm turning on and say, what's the news now? So media are obliged to present. Mm -hmm. And also, they are obliged in a way, personally I disagree, but technically it's like that, to provide uh, the loads of images. Too many of images. Mm -hmm. And also to make them attractive because the audience spends less and less time in reading Less than 10% of the audience are reading 970 words, which was a newspaper page. And this leads to provide even more streaking graphic images, blood and blood and blood. So these images that you just mentioned are by the side, not preferable. Mm -hmm. But this is where I'm focusing. Also where my research study is focusing. My research study focuses on the new form of the war, mm -hmm. how the war will be constructed from now on, the hybrid and also mainly on the human trauma, the memory in connection with history yeah. and the aftermath. Mm -hmm. And uh, the image that you just, you first mentioned with the women in red jacket carrying the canister of the water out of the pond, the yellowish water actually, mm -hmm. was taken outside of a refugee camp, okay, accommodate 75,000 citizens, if I may say which is a little bit ironic, mm. and located in Domiz in the north Iraq, in the autonomous Kurdistan region. 11,000, they were stranded outside because they couldn't be accommodated inside. And despite this harsh condition, 47 degrees of Celsius, no electricity, no water, no anything, technically, you can see her profoundly with a grace, was carrying that. Mm -hmm. The same happened when I found inside a girl, a young woman, strolling the pathway, the deserted pathways inside the camp with her red umbrella, like doing a red carpet. Mm -hmm. And this is where I'm focusing. 
in the real life, because life, yes, as any, any other soul must go on. And this is what we have to realize. And this is where we miss the point in every crisis, be a refugee or any other crisis, that a part of the numbers and the statistics that I can challenge them, but can be easily understood, that can have to be used in order to distribute funds, in order to categorize people. But categorizing a label, putting a label to a person, mm -hmm. you immediately take out his or her identity. You immediately delete, mm -hmm. in a way, his current course of life, the whole course of life. And you make her or him a number. Doing that, despite if you provide safety and security, it's like downgraded yeah. her or him from Maslow hierarchy on it, on the bottom where there is only survival offered and secured. Despite you offer security and safety and food and medical assistance, people are stranded there 24 hours, 7 days per week, 30 days per month, per month, and then what are they going to do? This is limbo, yeah. right? And they're going to look for the travel agent. This is how I call the smugglers. Yeah. And based on their financial capacity, they will take either first class ticket, like with 25,000 euros, dollar, US dollars, you can get a plane to Copenhagen. Mm. Or a shoestring, like crossing deserted lands, ice cover mountains, or trying to cross hostile seas yeah. in the Mediterranean. And this is where I focus. And I try to live with them. And that's why I'm focusing on the human. And the same happened to my other project of Sub-Saharan Sisyphus, mm -hmm. where I follow several years ago from Mogadishu. I took the boat with the smugglers and I followed their route through EMN. Mm -hmm. And then I met them back in Beirut. And together we resulted in a abandoned factory in the west part of Greece. And I mm -hmm. stayed there for, with them for almost a month. And then at the end, I, I raised my camera. We have to build a relationship with the people. Yeah. Otherwise, you are an, just an intruder. Definitely, all of us, we are outsiders. As yeah. the father of journal, photojournalism, Enrique Tjebreson pointed out, in photojournalistic reporting, unfortunately, you are an outsider. Mm. But we have to respect what we are doing, and we have to do it right, despite the framework we operate. And this is really harsh times for journalists, for the journalists, documentarians, financially speaking. Yeah. No, that really struck me, those photographs that you had in that um, Sub-Saharan Syphilis um, series. And again, that focus on, even in these dark conditions, of people in the factory, the textile band and textile factory, sharing food, sharing bread, and that sort of very fragile sense of community developing there. But then also, I think, that series speaks your commitment to um, highlight the the marginalised even within the crisis that then you know maybe there'd been less attention on some other people coming from Sub-Saharan uh, Africa um, so really focusing on you know the most the marginalised or the people who might not be getting other representation I want to ask you to speak to correct and actually inside this factory I wish I, and this is an ongoing project still for me, and this is where I'm focusing, they create their own societies. And uh, if we take into consideration from where they came, they came from a country for where the last 30 years there is a civil war, and a civil war between tribes, and a civil war towards an Arabization of this peninsula. Inside there, different tribes met. Mm -hmm. Supposedly, and to put it straightforward, they have to kill each other. Yeah. They are enemies. But they found their way inside yeah. to create a truce and compromisation and to live together and coexist in a way that will help us through their path. Mm. And it's, for me it's a great example, but I, I am sure I'm doomed. I don't have any chance to pass it to, the, to our modern and fast and furious society that is, if they have achieved that, why we don't yeah. look them as people, understand some differences, accept them and coexist. Yeah. Instead of that, we use them for our own purpose, from the governments, from the politicians that they are technically are expressing and they are using polls to understand what 
people, the voters ask, so to offer them. Mm -hmm. And this is what destroys the whole issue. And that's how we decided to make this exhibition and the book. Yeah. It's a collective work and it is of 11 people. Yeah. Why it's 11 people? This is really rare in the photography because it's impossible to cooperate with yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine 11, it's, it's really impossible. Yeah. But for me, this was the only way because if I was alone or the two of us or three, we can guide the audience mm -hmm. through our lenses. But there is the great variety in terms of age from young photographers, 20 years old, like myself that I'm over 50s, uh, men, women, mm. other working in agents, other uh, freelancers, other working for NGOs, whatever. It's this pluralism focuses and presents what we really wanted to present, the human. Yes. The name, apart and beyond and above of numbers, statistics, categories, whatever. These are easily can be found, provided by all organizations, you can have plenty of statistics and number. Where we are missing are the names. Mm -hmm. And the idea came to me because while the great flow of the refugees in 2014 and 2015 crossing the Aegean Sea from the Turkish source to the Aegean Island source, uh, every day we were listening. 150 people died, 72 people died, 32 people died, 16 people died, 230, X number, X any, 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 any physical number above the zero. But I never, I really never heard the name. Mm -hmm. If this Ahmed, Dimitris, Anna, Sayan, whatever. Yeah. Because these are humans with a name. And this is really important. And this importance arrived to me in 2014 while well, I was in Iraq, in the North Iraq, in the autonomous Kurdistan region, where when I got to, when I arrived to get an accreditation, they asked me what you did, whatever, and I present a job that I did back in 1991 mm -hmm. when uh, Kurds were, were chased by Saddam Hussein mm -hmm. with chemical. Yeah. They escaped through the Turkey, crossing the mountain for more than seven years, and I found them in, in a remote area. So I saw the, some of my images, and there was a girl, 20 something years old, 25 years old, Sai Anderson. I was there. You were there. Mm -hmm. And to cut along the store, we went and we met with her father. Her father saw the photos and recognized himself. Oh, wow. There is a continuity, and this is what we are ignoring. We categorize them as a number, and then we lead them in the best way, limbo, or in the worst way, marginalization in some of our European well-structured cities, leading them or creating them easy victims to theocracy, to patriarchy, mm -hmm. to whatever, and make them suicide bombers, killers, or whatever. Mm -hmm. When I was asked by Media House uh, after the uh, attack in Paris in 2015 in November, I told, I told the reporter, Imagine the two of us being in a metro and this guy comes inside 11 o'clock at night. In the, be in the best case, we will turn our heads, avoiding eye contact. Normally, we will change wagon or getting out. And this boy, if he ever tried to enter in this kind of a restaurant, he will never be accepted or seated. But using a Kalashnikov, he controls. Because it's everything about power. Mm. And they found this escape through false religious interpretation. For me, it's not Islam that can be accused. It's the interpretation. It's the same in every religion. Yeah. You, going back to the itinerary, I want to ask you... It's we never you, left. The this is an yeah. itinerary. The whole process is an itinerary. And That's why we, we put this label, itinerary. Yeah. The journey. Um, it said in the description too that it was inspired by the work of Hannah Arendt and this Transnational Law Summit is also taking inspiration from her book The Human Condition and I just want to hear your reflections of how you know Arendt's work and work um, words might have inspired, informed um, your practice in particular ways. Definitely and actually there is a work of Hannah Arendt, Hannah Arendt with the refugees. Yeah. Uh, my father brought to me when I was quite young, in mid-70s. 
and I read it, and we read it together actually, in order for me to understand what I just told you, that a part of the label is the human. Mm -hmm. And in that piece, Anna Red said, no, we don't want to be called as refugees. We, we came to France, if I'm not wrong, we came to France and we are more friends than France mm -hmm. people. And now we have to move out. Now we are more Americans than Americans. We are, uh, when we are in the United States, we avoid having the German paper because we want to enter inside the society, to be part of the society. And this is where we deny it. And, uh, and this is part of all of our works. And this is actually our life for me. Yeah. So that's why her work, her words are always current. I don't think will ever be outdated in any aspect. And uh, we have to understand and we have to use them. Uh, for me, books, in the wider aspect, is the real tool for a human to use it and to create really something important. Yeah. I think throughout the discussion that we've had already, I think the obligations and the responsibilities that you feel to the subjects that you're documenting, to your audience and also to your collaborators, has been so evident. But I wanted to ask you a little bit more about how particularly in the sort of situations and in the spaces of such conflict and crisis that you've been documenting, what are sort of the questions of ethics and obligation and responsibility and how you think about those? Uh, I'm smiling a little bit because this is something um, that I've been asked many times, mainly by friends, but also it's a question that I ask myself yeah. all the time. First of all, a kind of like a self-declaration, our job in conflict zone is the easiest one, trust me. It's the most easiest, easy job in, in the framework of journalism. In, in in investigative journalism, you have to look around, to check, to find sources, whatever. There is the crisis, so you go there. Mm -hmm. So first the obligation, first responsibility is to understand that you are there and why you are there. Mm -hmm. So you can't escape just like that. Yeah. Second on that, and most important for me, is to know the history. We have studied very, very well. If you don't know, you don't have to go there. Yeah. It's not like taking a double-decker tour, mm -hmm. paying a price of a ticket and taking just photos. Photos will be ugly, not only technically, but in the real sense of photography. Mm -hmm. As I said before, I stayed there in this release factory for days before racing yeah. the camera. The same applies in all of my job. Okay, of course, not in a crisis situation or in a, uh, in a, in a battle, mm -hmm. definitely. But Investigating the human, you have to live with them. Yeah. And trust me, it's not so difficult. This is what really understood from the very first time. The moment the people, they understood that they have studied their history, mm -hmm. first of all, they helped me to understand even better their history. And so in this respect, apart of some gestures and some etiquettes, this for me is really out of serious consideration. This is really just to put this different, they will understand you immediately. That you just read your bullet points, I have to do this, this, this and that, and uh, I mean, not to show your uh, feet in an Arab or how to shake hands, but this is, I mean, this is nothing for them. Mm -hmm. Deep history is what you have to know, and then you will understand everything. And that's also why we developed the book, and we put also our own stories, mm -hmm. how we feel when we deal, when we interact with these people, not just in journalistic way, yeah. uh, beyond and above any journalistic way. Uh, we as humans, yeah. not or, or not as professionals, how did we feel in this way? Because when you are there mm -hmm. in this situation, you are part of the situation. Yeah. You don't have the time to examine your emotions. It's later when you edited your images that you really cry, but you don't know why you are crying. I really don't know why I'm crying. Because I know why this is happening. Because war is business, definitely. So everything is explained. But I don't know why. Yeah. I feel helpless many of the times. Gosh. But yet you keep going and you've been doing this work for such a long time. Definitely you have to. Uh, if we all stop, they will win. 
This is not mine. In the opening ceremony of the Transnational Law Summit, we watched a beautiful movie, beautiful documentary, mm -hmm. True Warriors. And left and, high, left and right of uh, the screen, there was this motto, if we all stop, they will win. Mm -hmm. And while watching that, I returned back when I was in Sarajevo, back in the beginning, mid of 90s, when there was a 1993, May 1993, a beauty contest. Mm -hmm in the BC's city of Sarajevo. And uh, the winner, a 17 years old, if I'm not wrong, Olga must be her name. Don't know her name. You know, all of the winners, what they tearfully wish to the audience? World peace. Yeah. What she did, she unfolded the banner, don't let them kill us. Wow. So he, you see, this is timeless. Yeah. And this is where war is putting where war is gaining, because war doesn't have memory. Wars, they don't have memory. And they wait until there are no voices to tell what had happened, and they return to devour what they left behind. Yeah. You said elsewhere on your website that the duty of a photojournalist is to observe pain, to record and witness truth, hoping that governments and communities can then solve some of the problems. And I wanted to ask you about how you see the relationship between photojournalism, telling stories, and then social change and legal change. Again, in the new framework of the media, it's, I don't want to say impossible, it's almost impossible, for the reason I explained before. But we still have to try. And I'm sure we will find the way to keep doing that in the proper way. Uh, using even some tricks, mm -hmm. getting funds from something and using and then work with you. I think the only way is to do a long research, a deep investigation. Sometimes, most of the times you don't get anything. Most of the times you get igno ignorance or people they don't care, but sometimes you are doing that. Uh, f for three years, starting from 2010, uh, when the financial crisis started in Greece with the default, the financial mm -hmm. default, there were a lot of people appeared as homeless in the street, which was not common in Greece. In Greece, we didn't have homelessness. Uh, we never experienced homelessness, apart of some regular homeless or people they were for their own mm -hmm. uh, philosophy, if I may say, life philosophy. So I started investigating that, and during this investigation, I saw a lot of uh, drug users on mm -hmm. plain side during daylight doing drugs. And this was like shocking for me, mainly because I have seen that, but I didn't pay attention. I overpassed these people like garbage bins or mm -hmm. plastic bags thrown in the, in the streets. We just have to avoid them or a water pod in the street. And I live with them. I sleep with them on the street. And at the end, their stories reveal something more important, that uh, for the first time in Greece, Greece as a country, drug users overpass as a population of HIV positive the men having sex with men. Mm -hmm. So this was really shocking and the increase of HIV positiveness in among drug users uh, drug users was 1400 percent from the wrong. Oh, and this result appeared in a very important uh, conference in the Tufts University and uh, played in the way that we explained before with really streaking and graphic images. Maybe you have seen in my website. I, I right? saw you Accusing the victims. And then the, also you had the we're all potentially homeless. All right. As well. yeah. Accusing the victims has been the perpetrators. At that time, what the government did, the government sent the police forces, they collect uh, women from the street, and they just plain, they just put their faces publicly, which is not they force them for HIV test without their consensus and they solve the problem for the way. They solve the society, yeah. these are the enemies, we got them, now on the confine, you are safe. And they did that and ignoring that these women were sex workers because some male men went there and paying five euro, mm -hmm. this was the price for having sex, and the same and the next hour they were taking their kids to a kindergarten or playing the role of the father or whatever. Thanks God, or not thanks, <laughs> thanks God, this thing. Anyway, uh, this took a lot of attention and mm -hmm. a lot of things have happened after that. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. 
And this is uh, the biggest uh, price for me, financially speaking. I don't care. This is what I really care. Mm. I really don't care financially. I know that I can survive because all of the people that I document, they survived in a condition that I know I never face it. Mm. When I'm going there, I have good clothes, I have medicine, I can live. So since they are able to survive, I know I can survive with less. So I don't care now, but definitely younger people like Anna Pandelea, who is a really prominent photographer, or rest is a fellow of our team for these players that they are in their early twenties, they have to survive. Now I'm in better position because I really covered, I leave the golden years of photography, but this has something to be done also in this industry, because this industry pays a big price of the ruin, of news, of the destruction of the news through all the new way the media are operating. Yeah, you got that delightful series, we are all photographers now. We have photos of people taking pictures and it's quite humorous. We and I think there's sort of a darker sort of story that you're saying too of like the destruction of photojournalism. Destruction, and the, right. As a, I don't know. Is correct, this? correct, I totally agree. Mm. Yeah, but we are all photographers and there is nothing wrong to that. Mm. My qu uh, the point is how you use that. Yeah. It's like having a hammer. We can put a nail on the wall and put a beautiful paint, Mona Lisa. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you can take the hammer and smash the head of someone. Yeah. It's how you are using and how you interpret, how you project these things. I was in a refugee camp in South Turkey, in border with Syria, and I saw young uh, Syrians. They were what? Ah, they were shown to me and their cell phones, uh, YouTube uh, movies, mm -hmm. with atrocities. It took me not a long to understand that these were from gangs mobs in Mexico. Mm -hmm. But this presented to them as atrocities of the regime, the Syrian regime. Mm -hmm. We don't need these things. Yeah. Regime by itself is already too brutal. So using fake news, you just provide them excuse to that regime. And we, I keep saying we have to understand them, we have to see them, we have to listen to them, to listen to their stories. It's not the way we are, we are living. And they don't have to follow that. Like we don't have to follow their way of living. Mm -hmm. Not people in the Middle East, all over the world I'm speaking. It's just the coexistence of people, nothing else and nothing more. Yeah. We're trying to understand young girls and if they are entitled, uh, to be registered and take the asylum status or whatever, we never ask them how many times have been sodomized inside prisons. Mm. I met a girl in northern Lebanon in a makeshift kind of hospital of rebels in 2013, and uh, she stayed in total darkness for more than months, because her crime was that she was running Twitter. When she was thirsty, they brought a man in front of her, naked, and asked him to pee and to drink the urine. This is the greatest of insult. And if he refuses, he, they mm -hmm. should advise him. This is sold very easily. I never, I never publish it. Yeah. Because I don't like this, because this is too easy to create emotion. We play with emotion. And in the same way, we photographers, we play with these images of young kids, too many kids in the image, because, you know, appeal to emotions. Mm -hmm. Or having kids holding banners, don't send us back to Turkey. Did you ever consider, because te before taking this photo, that this kid is impossible to write these letters? He, he don't know how to write English, so someone else did it. Mm -hmm. So in this way, it's like serving, you can take another photo of the regime. They're doing the same. So we have to be very careful of that. And we have to work on the human, we have to convince our audience that there are really important issues, mm. so important that they don't, we don't have to have blood cells, we don't have to show a lot of kids, etc. By itself, the phenomenon is, it has its importance. I don't know if you understand me. Yeah, no, but there's a Stop. commitment to truth in what you're saying. 
And I guess from a legal perspective, we're used to maybe seeing photographs as evidence in court cases as sort of, you know, representations of truth. But I think what you're talking it's about too is a broader relationship between photography, law and justice. And Definitely. I want to ask you about, you know, here at a Transnational Law Summit, what it is that lawyers need to learn from photography, um, from image and from aesthetics? It's a great question, but we need a dedicated uh, discussion for that. <laughs> Too long. Evidence, yeah. It's like everything we have discussed before. It's the world, how this world is interpreted. It's different the evidence in law, mm -hmm. and it's different the evidence in sociology and in anthropology. My father was a law professor, okay. and that's why I didn't follow the law practice. <laughs> <laughs> because in early years I have to interact into this, and the evidence was a crucial part. And how we handle the evidence, the evidence sorry. It's absolutely the same for me, mm -hmm. at the end, in its core. And also, with this deluge of images, with this flood of images, we lost the meaning of the evidence. And at the end, they drop in, in the memory hall. We have to preserve the memory, this is the evidence. But the evidence by itself, in law, says something practical, because there are forensics, etc., that justify something. In the photography, you have to go beyond. You have to come inside the, mm. the frame, you have to try all its photographer's responsibility to bring you where and how he decided to take this frame. Okay. It's like, for example, if we see it together, like seeing a photo from Buchenwald, mm -hmm. Germany, after the liberation, and you see an image of Jews that just liberated. By itself, for me, is nothing if you don't examine the reasons why concentration camps created. What lead, what, why society allow this to happen? This is the role of the photography. Yeah. So for you're me, in a... Oh. No, no, no. Uh, I was just thinking for me, when people are asking me about, I told them, go and study the classics yeah. and the paint. See an image of Peter Brigel the Elder, landscape with the fall of Icarus. This is how war is explained for me. Have to say this. I, do, I will. I'll make sure to look it up after. Yeah, because it's a beautiful landscape with the sun, peasants taking care of their uh, fields, farmers, sheep, the city, and in the right, in the right below corner, there are just the legs of the Icarus plunges out of our indifference. This is the same what is happening. Yeah. I was going to ask you. Um, you're on a panel here talking about migration as a local phenomenon and your previous response you sort of talking about the, the global causes and how they manifest locally. So how do you as a photojournalist manage to represent, I guess, how global phenomena, transnational phenomena, how they manifest locally or maybe how local things also have much broader global roots, background, systemic causes? I try this, and also this is, can be connected with our work of itinerary. That's why we didn't focus on a specific area. Actually, the islands, the Greek islands, are really picturesque mm -hmm. from the touristic point of view, and also providing the contrast with the people drawn, with the people arrived, mm -hmm. with the life jackets, etc. But this is not enough for me. This is because this is just a spot. In the same spirit, if you present a success story of a camp or an initiative by an NGO, for me it's again the same, absolutely nothing. And I realized it that uh, when I saw my fellow citizens in Greece, how they were treating refugees, and they were treating them like marathon runners, where they are running in front of your house, but you know they are living, they are just passing in front of your house, so you're just supporting them by clapping, maybe you give them a bottle of water or something, you encourage them running. Yeah. The moment they realized that these people might stay, everything changed. Yeah. And that's why we work together, the 11 of us, and we present something through the route. Yeah. And this route has, is indefinite, has no stop. And all of us, we have to understand that this is happening because of a situation in a country or in a territory, in a wider or smaller territory. But quite soon, we as humanity, we, have, we will face, and the climate 
migration, yeah. which will not be just a migration of some people decided from a country like, for example, Pakistan to live for a better future yeah. or because their country teared apart by the war, like Syria. This will be a real movement. And what we lack is a transnational understanding and transnational law as well. Yeah. Crossing or taking all this, let's call it again, itinerary, there is no international court to take care of all the atrocities, of all, of everything that is happening. There is not a refugee court. Okay. On top of that, we are observing, for example, the United Nations uh, offer co-chair in Turkey uh, in the uh, agency where they control the work of the NGOs. This is by itself ironic. Yeah. We, don't, we don't have to say more on that. You see, there are specific interests. So it's on our ass, on the people, and it's a great responsibility to the academic community to consider these issues and to work towards that. Yeah. Because, unfortunately, politicians and political parties are working by the poll, by whatever, and they have to maintain their status within a three, four, five, a small period of time yeah. on elections. We are blessed to work on that, and we have to use this power. The academia, the journalists, anthropologists, investigators, and to create the real framework for real law to reappear. Yeah. My opinion. Yeah. In one of your lectures, you talk about the invisible and the unseen. And I was really struck by that distinction. And I was wondering if you could elaborate too on how you see the difference or this how is, you distinguish between the This is something and the that I love. This is actually an initiative by a great anthropologist in uh, Cambridge, in uh, Crass, uh, Dr. Christus Linteris. Uh, he created this. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly, more or less, what we just discussed about the invisible and the unseen what is inside the image and what is the image implies, what the image carries with it. Mm -hmm. How we will not allow an image to fall into the hall of ignorance. How we, we can preserve the memory and how we can read behind the lines. And behind also there are lines yeah. inside the image because every image has a story. When someone a young photographer or whatever bring me a photo or a portfolio to see it, I ask one single question, what's your story? Mm. Because every photographer, every image has to carry, obliged to carry a story. Technically it might be crap, but if the story is strong, that's enough. Mm -hmm. If it is technically also perfect, that's, yeah. that's the perfect thing. And this is what uh, Dr. Linter is trying to investigate through this course of uh, seminars, workshops and lectures. And it was a great work, and uh, we worked through a lot of images. For example, there is an image I recall from uh, southeastern Ukraine, which is also facing the war, the new, st new status of war, the hybrid war, where I met uh, an old lady scrolling a baby scroll, baby scroll, and I realized that this is very old. Baby scroll. I said, Something important is this, so I stop her, and we start discussing, and this was she preserved of her daughter, but her daughter is like uh, 40, she's in the hospital, her husband died out of a sniper, and she has to survive out of 30 euro uh, pension. And this is a story. And as a photographer, and as all of us, we have to understand, we have to look on these details to get the, the story that is behind and the, and the importance of the story. Otherwise, you would just run behind uh, what the news, uh, how they will pay, okay, you can go to a conflict zone, blood, you can go to a humanitarian disaster, kids. There is a certain framework, that, or a bullet, or a checklist, you, if you follow, you're okay. You're okay. Your daily bread is covered. But it's not something that we have to do. We are obliged to carry the message and to preserve the memory and the history. So I want to ask you, how does your work function on a daily basis? So sort of the, the man, mundane logistics. So how do you manage to do what you do? Yeah, that's a good and tricky question. <laughs> uh, definitely, it's really tough, as we said before. It's mm -hmm. really, um, 
we live in a really tough uh, times. We experience financially speaking and logistically speaking, and also the way news are structured and distributed today create this uh, situation. But um, if you're clever enough, you can find this way, just to put it as a title. Subtitle, AIDS matters. I mean, okay, I'm start, I started uh, photography in the 80s, from the beginning of the 90s I'm dealing with the war. I have good connections, to put mm -hmm. it straightforward. Uh, working with universities helps a lot. Uh, this maintains my integrity and helps to maintain my integrity. Mm -hmm. For younger us, really difficult. And there are a lot of really talented people that they can't find their way in the industry. And they are also, the industry by itself didn't help at all. Uh, now there is a new trend, I hope, with some things that appear, uh, the so-called uh, journalistic awards and uh, whatever competitions, mm -hmm. that it's a trap, it's a total trap. Anyway, for those that they want, they will succeed. And there are several ways where you can work with NGOs, we can work with uh, several funds, we can apply, we will work. Even in the traditional way, you can play their game, offering them the images that I said, like, you want blood, take blood. You want kids, kids. Yes, but on the parallel, you do your job. And definitely, you will find the way. Mm -hmm. Going now to the conflict zone, this is really difficult. Yeah. And especially nowadays, nowadays, since uh, just before the eruption of the so-called Arab, Arab Spring, uh, people in the peninsula they understood this is a real business for them. And uh, I don't want to enter into the discussion of ransom, whatever happened to many people, but uh, all young photographers, they were the victims there, and they pay enormous amount to uh, set the so-called fixers, etc. But this brings us back to what we have discussed in the beginning, that you have to respect the place you are going. Mm -hmm. You have to study the history, you have to understand the people, you have to live with them. If you do that, they will offer you really everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not like I'm old enough and I spend years. I can tell you that if you do that now, they will do, because people need their stories to be told. Yeah. The invisible needs to be visible. There are a lot of things to be told, and if you show that you are an honest person and you care, really care about the topic, not just to become the star, mm -hmm. yes, they will offer you everything. And financially, it's not that tough. But if you go as an intruder, then you have to pay the price. As I said before, if you travel, if you pay the ticket in the double decker, you just take some images, but you will not took the real image. It's it's on you. It's really tough. Financially, it's tougher than ever before, but still there is room to do honest job and to maintain your integrity. And this is really, really not difficult. Also in conflict zone, you can be em embed. You can, and this is really also something that we don't have to elaborate now because mm -hmm. we'll need more than a day to discuss it. But there are ways, there are ways, there are ways. The most difficult thing is, I keep saying, is to maintain your integrity and to avoid being in front of your topic. That's why since mid 90s I avoid publishing my image with my name and I'm using an alias. I don't want to be the star. I don't want, really. And this is really easy to become. It is really easy to use. It's what Susan Sontag said in a different way, the pain of the others. Yeah. For me it's really disgusting to use the pain of the others for your own gain. Financially, yes, you will be paid. Of course, you're working. How I will pay my electricity bill to give to the electric to the company a photo? I will not accept. I, I I would be more than happy to do that. If I go to a restaurant and have a dinner, how I'll give them an image? No. Okay, there is nothing wrong of getting paid. There is wrong to take advantage of your topic and become the star. That many of great photographers did it. Mm -hmm. And they manipulated populations in Latin America for being the real stars. And running the exhibition where they are selling them and said, there is nothing wrong to sell you, but you have to sell them. Yeah. Where is wrong is if you don't respect the people, the history, the civilization, yeah. and no. the memory, more important.